is this thing a cool car or what? I've always loved the 57 T-Bird. These small birds are just too cool, man. I'd love to own one. I'd love to own this one here. On this episode of Operation Mustangs and More, I got a K-Code that's going out the door. K-Code, that's a 65, 66, and even a 67 car that has special engine in it. We got a viewer's rides thing going on, and I test drive the Mustang too. Yeah, black and gold King Cobra that we go for a test drive with. You know, these cars were actually innovators for the future Mustangs, or the Mustang 3s as I call them, the Fox Body cars and the others. So stay tuned because we got a great show coming up. This episode's test drive, we're in a Mustang II. Now the Mustang IIs are a real important part of the history of the Mustang, because without the Mustang IIs, we wouldn't probably have the Mustangs we have today, or they would have been lost for a while and brought back. You know, like Chevrolet did with the Camaro. They dropped the Camaro for a few years and then they brought it back. Well, you know, these Mustang IIs were very successful. They sold almost 400,000 Mustang IIs the first year they were out in 1974. 400,000, it was like 385,000, blah, blah, blah. Though in the whole time they sold the Mustang IIs, the five year run from 74 to 78, they sold 1.1 million of these things. We're talking the Gias, the Cobra IIs, the Mach 1s, the Little Coupes, they had a stallion edition. They had all sorts of stuff. These things went through the 70s, and people really did have a lot of fun with them. They get a little bit of jabbing from the rest of the Mustang guys out there, maybe because they're a little smaller, and they got the big bumpers on them that all cars from the 70s had. You know, it seems like <clears throat> that mandated bumper system that they had in the 70s created an atmosphere with no matter what size car you had, if it was a little car like one of these Mustang IIs or a big car like a Torino or a Lincoln, you got the same size bumper. I mean, it just kind of seems that way. Those bumpers back then were more like battering rams than something that would absorb energy. That's about the only styling cue on the Mustang II that just looks a little odd. They actually have a lot of styling cues on them that really echo the early Mustangs. They got the nice little side sculpture that everybody's familiar with that make them recognizable as a Mustang. They got the grill opening and the two headlights that stick out. They got the tail lights on them that have them make them look you know, similar to the old Mustangs. They got that fastback look to them. And then of course they got the scoops and the spoilers and the stripes and all sorts of things. Now a lot of good things came out of these Mustang twos. Number one, it was the first year that standard on these Mustang IIs, you would get a tachometer. So all Mustang IIs, whether it was a four-cylinder or a V8, got a tachometer. The other thing they got, which set the standard, was disc brakes. You know, up until this time, it was a drum brake thing or an option. Now, it was disc brakes. The other standard they set, rack and pinion steering. These Mustangs got rack and pinion steering to the point where guys retrofit the Mustang II rack and pinion steerings on their hot rods. That's how good of an idea and how good of a fit it was on the Mustang IIs. They, the guys were taking them off of the Mustang IIs or using that system on hot rods. So these are really good cars. They steer down the road so nice and straight. I mean, look at this. I'm going straight down the road and it handles good. That, that rack and pinion steering, man, you can't beat it. I mean, it's tight. Um, and of course the brakes. You got power disc brakes on most of these cars and uh, they stop on a dime. So they are really good cars. The V8 ones, especially with a four speed, they'll lay rubber all the way down the road, man. I mean, these things were quick too. So I've always loved the Mustang too. 
I bought a 74 brand new when I had long hair down to my shoulders. Uh, and I just love the heck out of that car. I drove that thing like you would not believe. A lot of fondness with my Mustang, too. Um, but this gentleman dropped it off because we actually got to do an engine overhaul and a transmission overhaul on this one. It's got, uh, it's got about 75, 80,000 miles on what we're thinking the motor and trans have. And it's not so much from a mileage standpoint, from just an age standpoint. So let's get her back to the shop, fix her on up, and then take her for another test drive after we're done with this motor and trans. I'm having just a lot of fun bringing back memories driving this car. For the car show this weekend? And I got a hot deal, too. You think? Think again. Oh, man. Tired of back orders? You need NPD. With four strategically located superstores, orders are shipped direct to your door within one to three business days. National Parts Depot has quality restoration parts for Ford Truck, Mustang, Camaro, Chevelle, and Firebird. For your free catalog, visit NPD online or call toll free. During the 60s, my mom and dad, they always seemed to have a, a newer Lincoln or Chrysler Imperial. And those kind of cars had leather interior. Well, Mustangs don't generally have le leather interior. Well, a company called Distinctive that's been around forever, uh, they pretty much are the guys that brought back all the classic seat upholstery in the early 70s. They came up with a leather kit for not only the older Mustangs, but for the newer late models too. And we put a set of, uh, of leather upholstery on a late model Mustang seat took off the old raggly cloth stuff that certainly served its time, but uh, wore out just the same. Uh, so as an upgrade, we went with the leather, and man, I tell you what, it's nice and glove soft. It's got that leather smell to it, and uh, it really does make the seat look 100% better and really upscale, too. So look for Distinctive for their leather kits, for their factory replacement kits, because if you just want to keep it stock, they got the stock vinyl, they got the stock cloth, but if you want to step up to bat, go with their leather stuff, man. It really does look dynamite. You know, recently I became a writer, uh, article writer for Fox Mustang Magazine and Mustang Magazine. You guys need to get subscriptions to these things. As a matter of fact, if you go on my Facebook, facebook.com backslash Operation Mustang, you can enter to win a free subscription to these magazines. Every week I give away a subscription to them. But one thing I noticed in this latest issue of Fox Mustang Magazine is a cool thing they got back here. It's called the Fox Hunt. And people have listed cars that they have for sale. One in particular is an 86 SVO. Now the SVOs are pretty uh, unique cars. They had this turbocharged four-cylinder. They were actually faster than the GTs back in those days. <clears throat> they were rated about 210 horsepower. And I think that they're particularly a really cool car. But check that out. The guy is only asking $8,500 for this thing. Uh, he's out of Florida, so it's probably a pretty clean car. But uh, check out Fox Mustang Magazine, Mustang Magazine. Check out the articles I got going in there. You could also go to the article in the magazine, go over to co your computer, and I got a video posted on their website to help you go through the uh, article I got in there. You know, in early 64, when the Mustang first came out, there were actually 64 and a half Mustangs, what they're considered 64 and a half Mustangs nowadays. And the reason being is because from April of 64 to August of 64, the Mustangs they were producing had little differences on them than the September of 64 and on the 65 Mustangs. Now here's a 64 and a half Mustang here. It's a nice looking red convertible. And uh, the differences on these 64 and a half cars are many. The hood itself, believe it or not, it's got a different hood on it than a 65 car. The 64 and a halfs had this little leading edge over here on the hood that would protrude down. Well, the 65s, what they did was they folded that up. But on the 64 and a halfs, to accommodate this, over here on the fender extension, they have this little relief here, so this way that um, hood wouldn't dive up into that thing. That's kind of a neat thing that they did there. Uh, also, they had cooling fins on the radiator support. These three fins right here are cooling fins for the battery itself. I always wondered why they changed that one. 
because it's not a bad idea to have cooling fins. Newer cars have cooling passages for their batteries. They could have left that one in there. It also has a generator underneath the hood. Now, a generator was, a, was a, an apparatus that they used all through the 50s, and most early cars had generators on them. But in the early 60s, they started getting away from the generator and into the alternator. As a matter of fact, the first American car to have an alternator was the 63 Lincoln convertible. I owned one of those a few years ago, and that car itself had a lot of innovations on it. Um, the brake light switch on a 64 and a half has a hydraulic type of an action to it as, a, as opposed to a mechanical type of action to it. So there's another difference there. It had a different power steering pump system on it. Uh, this is an Eaton pump, what's referred to as an Eaton pump by the maker that made them, as opposed to Ford started making their own pumps in 65 and 66 cars. The engines on these 64 and a half cars, uh, they had their own engines. This one here is a 260. Well, that's a, a 64 and a half engine only. Uh, that was an F code engine. In the serial number, what you have is letters that indicate what size engine is in your car. And this one here is an F code. The other uh, V8 engine they offered on a 64 and a half was a 210 horsepower 289 four barrel engine. Uh, and that engine there um, <clears throat> was a really rare engine to have too, but it was only 64 and a half. The 65 cars had the 225 horsepower, the A code engine. Um, the other couple of differences that these 64 and a halves are actually quite a few. The Mustang name on the side of a 64 and a half is actually shorter than the one on a 65 that is just a tad longer. The doors themselves <clears throat> and the way they work and, and open and close the, the switch that uh, illuminates the inside of the car, that's a difference right there. There's, a, there's a, a relief in there to accommodate that door switch that the 65 cars have and the 64 and a half cars don't. The whole horn apparatus over here where the steering wheel is, it's got a different steering wheel on it, it's got a different horn apparatus, there's a difference there. The fan switch for the heater, off is in the center and your speeds are left to right as opposed to a 65 car, off is to the left and your speeds are all the way to the right. That's kind of a neat thing that they, that they did that. Even the gas cap, believe it or not, the gas cap on a 64 and a half is different than a 65. And what's the difference? The difference is the 64 and a half car doesn't have a security cable on it. You know, they got wise to the point that people were stealing these gas caps. So in the 65 car, the true 65 car, it actually had a cable on there to prevent people from stealing these things. The, um, the tail light lenses have 64 on them. There's another difference right there. There's all sorts of things on these cars. You just keep going around and around them and you can see all sorts of things. Look at the horns up here, check this out. These horns look like something from some sort of a 50s car. That's because that's from the generation they were. <clears throat> it's a big old thing and they make a lot of nice sound too. The, the horns on the 64 and a half cars were really nice loud horns. <laughs> Sounds like school bus. <laughs> the voltage regulator is a difference on them. So there's a lot of differences on these 64 and a half cars as opposed to the 65 cars. One of the big differences on this true 64 and a half car, the body style. They only made coupes and convertibles for the first six months. It wasn't until late August, early September that they started making the fastback body style. So they only had two body styles for the 64 and a half cars and the true 65s had the third body style. So check them out. They are a little bit more valuable, in my opinion, than the, uh, than the actual 265 cars. Um, <clears throat> but just the same, they're Mustangs, and I love them just the same. Hi, the Doc here from Mustang Restorations. You know, in over 30 years of restoring these old classics, I've dealt with a lot of companies. And Dallas Mustang has been with me since the 1980s. You go to their website, dallasmustang.com. You'll see parts for the 64 to 73 car, the Fox body car, and of course all that late model stuff that's out there. And for you guys that have a late model Chevy or Dodge sitting next to your pony in the garage, they got stuff for that too. Their phone number, 1-800-MUSTANG. How cool is that? And if you give them a call, make sure you tell them that the doc sent you. One of the more common problems with uh, cars from the 60s is the window regulators and the window mechanisms had these little rollers on them <clears throat> that controlled them coming up and down on the, uh, in the door itself. 
and even the quarter windows. These are them right there. This is an old original one here, and this is a replacement one here. They come in different colors. But where they're located inside the door <coughs> is on this window regulator guide here. And what happens is this thing here crumbles and falls to the bottom of the door. Now, how does this thing work? Well, basically what you got is if you look on the inside of that little shaft right there, there's a little relief that this clip actually kind of clips onto. And what happens is when this thing breaks and falls to the bottom of the door, your door glass shifts and goes from one side to the other. So the fix is to roll the, door, the window up where you can, get the old piece either out of the guide or out of the bottom of the door. And it, like I say, what it does is it clips in here like that. So what you'll do is you'll take a screwdriver and you'll trip the clip just a little bit so you can pull this thing back. Then slide the, the, uh, the uh, roller out of there and then slide your new one in. Now I usually put a lot of oil and a lot of grease in these whole guides here and, and the little shafts because the more lubricant you can use, the better. So you want this to work real well. Then kind of push this thing up into place and kind of just snap that in. You hear that snap? That makes sure this thing is not going to come out of there. So when the window rolls up and down, you see how it kind of is on that guide right there. That's the idea. Otherwise, <clears throat> what's going to happen is this whole thing here will come out of there. Okay? And now the window will shift and go down one way or up another way, and now your window's off out of kilter. So make sure the clip is saddled where it should be, slide it into the, sh to the guide, and then get the little shaft there and snap it into place and you should be good to go. Those same little rollers are not only in your doors but they're in your quarter panel windows too. So for guys that have the coupes and the convertibles you're gonna have that issue there. <clears throat> if you look at my YouTube um, how-to's you'll see that I have a whole thing on how to replace the ones in the back and how to replace the ones in the door and of course how to take your door panels off. You guys need to go on my YouTube setup, man. I got a lot of how-to videos on that thing there, man. I got like 250 how-to videos. You know, every time I make one of these shows, I chop up the little how-tos for you guys so you could have your own little separate how-to. If you want to walk out in the garage with your laptop, set it up, press play, and there I am doing the how-to for you so you can do it on your own car. So stay tuned for the next segment. You know, on a serial number of an automobile, it's like a treasure trove of information. And one of the things particular on a Mustang VIN number is that fifth digit. Now, that fifth digit should be a letter on the 60s and the 70s Mustang. And that letter indicates what engine it's got in it. Real important thing. But we've been working on this uh, K-Code Mustang, Fastback GT, for a while, and it's ready to go out the door. Now, a K-Code is a 271 horsepower, high-performance uh, 289 engine. Uh, this is a blue GT, uh, pony interior car. Check it out. Customer came to pick it up. As a matter of fact, he took it two days later to his first uh, car show, got first place. Take a look. I'm with Jeff, Jeff Auberg. He bought this 65 K-Code Fastback that we've been restoring for a few years now. And uh, he's here today to pick it up. We're going to talk to Jeff a little bit. Hey, Jeff, uh, so you've been into cars for many years, huh? Yeah, quite a few years now. It's been about seven since I started. Okay, and uh, are you into Mustangs in particular? You like other cars too, or? Yeah, well, Mustangs mostly. That's what I started out when I first got into the collecting. I didn't know anything about cars and was very unfamiliar with car collecting or cars in general and uh, asked around, talked to folks, and they uh, talked about Mustangs and saw that there's you know, ease of getting parts. Um, you were local. I found that out because I lived in Chicagoland at the time mm -hmm. and uh, decided that that was a good place to start was with the Mustang. So my first Mustang was a 69 Mustang GT um, convertible. That was my first one. I have, in, uh, I have other cars. I've had, uh, right now I have an MGB 
with MGB. Um, I still have the 69 Mustang. Uh, I also have had a Studebaker Silver Hawk and a uh, big old Chrysler 55 Windsor Nassau Deluxe. <laughs> I remember that car. We had to work on that thing a few times. Yeah. We had to take a, take a couple of stalls we were working on that one there. So I bet you can't wait to get the, the GT home, huh? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I've been waiting for this. This is this to be really fun. It's a neat What's car. your first show? When are you taking it? Uh, it's actually this weekend, uh, this Saturday. So as soon as I get it home, uh, clean it up just a little because it's almost in perfect, you know, yeah, uh, nick right. right now. Looks good, um, right? Yeah, it does. <laughs> and then uh, just take it straight to the show up uh, near my house in Cedar Rapids in an AACA show. Cool, cool. Well, I've been anxious to get the car uh, to you. You've been a real patient man, but I hope the end result uh, was worth the wait. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, it's, uh, I love the car. It's the third one you've done for me now, as you know. Mm -hmm. And again, I get raves every place I go. You know how you guys do the lines and the fit and finish on the car is just fabulous, and people rave about it all the time. And actually, I wind up giving out a lot of your cards to people, okay. uh, asking, even though I'm in Iowa, yeah. they ask where I got the work done. Well, I do appreciate it, and, and thanks for the job, and thanks for the work, Jeff. Gladly. You know, in over 30 years of rebuilding old classic cars, we've done a lot of welding here at Mustang Restorations, and I've had a lot of welders. And I've been dealing through a company named HTP. They set me up with this pretty cool welder. It's a 200 amp. The thing I like about this thing is that it's its heat settings. A lot of them have a heat setting, maybe one to four, or one to three, or one to six, or whatever. This one not only has the one to six heat setting, but then it's got this. Uh, increment setting down here, meaning you can go to number one and then set it up to number four to get the maximum out of number one. Then if that's not enough, go to number two and then back it off as far as your increments go there. So I've been, I've been dealing with some pretty thick steel today, so I got up to number five and I've dialed into number three down here. So I like that. You can dial it in. They carry a full line of not only welders, but plasma cutters. Also the accessories that go along with those things. So go on their website, usaweld.com, and check out all the stuff they got. Pretty cool place to be. You know, sometimes things that seem like they're going to be the simplest thing to do just end up to be a real pain in the neck. And one of the things in particular is removing the whole wiper arm on a Mustang or Camaro or a lot of other American cars. You'd think, well, I'm just going to replace that arm. Just take a screwdriver to it and kind of pry up on it. Well, that's kind of the wrong thing to do. Don't be doing that. I get a lot of people that are prying on these things. They break the pivot. They scratch their paint. It's just not a good thing to do. So what they came up with is Snap-on and some other companies have this little unique tool right here. And uh, what it does is it kind of hooks onto the bottom edge there and gives equal force on the pivot area of this wiper arm. And it allows you to kind of pivot it off of the stock. See how nice that is? Now, one thing you'll notice in these stocks is all these little indexes. There's got to be, you know, probably 100 little indentations here to allow you to dial this thing in. So when you do put your new wiper arm on, what I normally do is turn the system on and off, make sure this thing returns back to park, and then kind of experiment a little bit. You can kind of put it there, you can put it there, use your tool to kind of center the thing, and then kind of just make it go back on where you kind of want it. And it kind of snaps back on the way it came off, just pushes back on. So there's a tool for everything out there. There's even a tool to take wiper arms on and off. So check out all your tool guys out there for anything you're doing. Before you start doing something, make sure there's not a tool for it first so you don't hurt yourself and hurt your car. I've been encouraging my viewers and my fans to send me in pictures of their cars and videos of their cars. And a couple of people have sent me in videos that they've posted on YouTube of problems they're having with their cars. I love that. Do that. Get those videos posted on YouTube. I'll check them out. In my last episode, I showed how a gentleman with a 69 coupe was having a problem with hesitation. And my diagnosis was that his accelerator pump circuits were clogged or there was something going on there that wasn't right. So he took that advice and he ran with it. And I got a response from him. It says, thank you for answering my question and putting me on the show. Quite honored. So here's what I got. 
After watching your video, you were exactly right. I was not getting initial squirt out of the primary circuits of the jets. In fact, nothing at all was coming out of them. Tried compressed air through them and nothing. Replaced the plunger, nothing. I called Edelbrock like you had said. The guy told me to remove the top of the carburetor and take the Torx bit out of the top squirter and soak the squirters for about an hour or so. Seemed weird, but it worked. Now the car runs better than ever. Thanks so much again for the help, Doc, and I'll keep watching. So post those uh, videos of the problems you're having on YouTube. I'll pick them off of YouTube. I'll put them on my show, and I'll try and help you out. You know, I picked up this Bronco last fall, and my intentions were to drive it through the winter and put a plow setup on it. Well, that ain't gonna happen. Uh, you know, around in these parts here in Illinois, these Broncos are just rusty things. I mean, like most cars. And uh, this one here is from Alabama. My wife found this on the internet, said, honey, here's a perfect plow truck for you. Go look, take a look at it, it doesn't have any rust. Well, once I looked at it, it had 36 inch or 38 inch super swampers on it. The thing was lifted way up there. I actually lowered this thing down and put smaller tires on it. I mean, this thing is a really cool truck. But I just didn't have it in my heart to run it through one of my Illinois winters. So I put this cool looking hood on there. I, I lowered it a bit, put these tires on there. And then I just kept it inside over the winter and got my old, old black Bronco together and, and plowed through the winter. Luckily, we didn't have a big winter this, this season. But I've been encouraging uh, most of my viewers to send me in pictures of their cars. Got a lot of viewers out there, a lot of uh, followers on my Facebook, and uh, they've been sending me all sorts of pictures of their beautiful cars. I have a great fan base. Check it out. Uh, it's really a cool thing what people have been sending me. Well, thanks for watching this episode of Operation Mustangs and more. Hey, make sure you go to the website winthemustangs.com. It's the Mustang Dream Giveaway. They're giving away a new Shelby and an old Shelby. It's for a great cause. It's for the wounded veterans. You know, these are guys and gals that have really given a lot up to protect the freedoms and the rights that you and I have in this country. So make sure you go to that website. Also, my Facebook. Go to Facebook.
facebook.com backslash operation mustang i give away all sorts of stuff every week on my wall i list about a half a dozen names of winners so keep an eye on my wall keep an eye on my facebook and keep an eye on my show until next time remember this doctor the doctor of restoration i'm always in thanks for watching